business uses of online services. The online services that we're going to be looking at are collaborative working online, version control, transactional data, and targeted marketing. So what is collaborative working online? It simply means using software that connects to the internet, which allow people to work across many sites or different locations around the world. Now, the most popular ones that we might know of are the cloud services such as Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, um, Word Online, and Google Docs, all tied into the same, all using the same type of technology, right? For example, I can have a Word document open and I can have a friend typing in that same Word document from anywhere in the entire world once I've given them permission to do so. It could be via email address, it could be via link, it might be temporary, it might be permanent. So if you're working in a company, I have friends who work all over the world, and when they have to collaborate with people online, the best way to normally do this is to have, for example, a shared folder or a shared document. So again, this all links back to some form of cloud storage or some form of cloud computing. So here we have some advantages of working collaboratively online. It says saves time and resources. Now, I agree with this 100%. Emails take up a lot of time. So imagine I needed to ask someone a question back and forth, back and forth, asking a question of something that we're working on together. A more sensible way to do this would be to simply, as I've said before, create a Word document, a PowerPoint, a spreadsheet, and simply do my section. That person can do their section, and I can simply check on what they've done, and I can give feedback in the document live Compared to having a phone conversation, calling back and forth, sending emails back and forth, it takes a bit of time. Increased productivity. I don't have to wait on that person to be in the document for me to be working. That person doesn't have to wait for me to be in a document for them to work. We're on different sides of the planet. When it's nighttime here, it's daytime there, so on and so forth. There's no need for us to wait on each other. So productivity should be increased. It says improved communication as well. Yes, because work is being done more efficiently, there's less need for us to communicate full stop. So because of that as well, communication can be improved. I don't need to get up from my um, office chair, let's say, and go to the phone and phone someone in America and ask them any questions. I can simply pop the message in the shared Word document that we have and they can reply as and when they need to. Remote collaboration is made easier. I mean, that's obviously a part of it and it boosts team morale i don't know about that some people do like working with people i'm one of those people that work well by myself however if you are someone that prefers to work at night or on your own or in your own time then this might be something that's a big benefit to you another main one i can think of is actually saving money and in the book here it says saving money time and the environment money is quite obvious we don't have to pay to travel into work to do the same thing that we can do from home companies would save as well because they, don't have, they no longer have to rent an entire office building or office space just so people can come there and use the internet. The internet, which here in the UK, most people have in their house. I think it's now become a necessity like electric, gas, and water, right? Um, so that's how companies could save as well. None of the charges that they would normally have with renting out a building is going to be associated with them. So they could potentially save thousands of pounds per month by having people work from home, by having people work collaboratively online. Next on the list, we have version control. So version control is important to keep track of changes and keep every team member working on the right version. It's in the name, version control, right? So all this is, it's a system normally in software engineering, software development, programming, so on and so forth, where there is a, some form of software system which tries to keep track of every change that has ever been made. So let's just say for argument's sake, we have two, three people working on a document at once, right? those two, three people are going to make changes on a daily basis. So version one of that document or version zero, whichever one you want to choose, is the empty document which was created on Monday. On Monday evening, version two, let's say, is going to be the document uh, that everybody's added a bit to, right? However, in between that, we should be able to see all the changes that each person made. This is now being made very easy on OneDrive, Microsoft, um, word on, on on onedrive and also google drive google docs so i can go in and i can see exactly when i typed this specific sentence exactly when it saved it exactly when person a typed their sentence and so on and so forth so sometimes when students say oh yes sir i finished my work last week and they upload it or they add it onto teams or it's just on teams they don't know that i can actually go in and check exactly when they did that piece of work 
So that's what version control does. It simply allows you to control the version. You should use version control software for all code files and assets that multiple team members with, will collaborate on. Yeah, because it just helps everyone have a backup to know what exactly has been changed. So imagine you worked on a piece of code for an entire hour and at the end of it, it doesn't work. However, an hour before this, it was working perfectly fine. You know that you could go back and you could um, run the original code and it would work fine. This has been done many times in online gaming. Many games, after an update, the game just doesn't work anymore for some people. So what companies have done, they've gone back to a previous version. So they've used version control software to go back to a previous version and they've pushed out the older version to make sure it works while they work on the fix. Next, we have transactional data or, trans or transaction data. This is simply how companies collect information on what customers buy, what they use to buy it. So for example, you go onto Amazon, eBay, Net uh, Netflix, any one of these websites, the company will hold your bank details. They will know how much you've spent on a particular item. Now, this is really good for them because it allows them to maybe track how many times you've spent. And it could be good for you as well, because if they're holding your transactional data, they know that over the last one year, you've paid for Netflix 12 times. So maybe next month, they'll give you one month half price or one month free, whatever the case is. So transactional data, it's in the name again. Transactions, well, financial transactions normally. It's normally to do with money. It's normally to do with you buying something from a company. So transactional data is simply money data or purchase data from a specific company. I'm a big fan of eBay and Nectar points. I've linked my Nectar points, my Nectar card to my eBay account because I get loyalty points. Loyalty cards are sometimes issued by companies for people who tend to buy a lot of things. So because I tend to buy a lot of electronics on eBay, I get a lot of Nectar points. So that's a benefit there for me. So it also ensures that the company can actually market specific things to you. Because if I'm always on eBay buying electronics, I buy laptop screens, monitors, keyboards, graphics cards, motherboards, RAM, SSDs, all of that stuff, right? I'm buying that stuff consistently. So whenever there is a good deal that comes out for one of those areas of, of components, right? eBay normally sends me a message. Amazon normally sends me a message saying this thing is now 10, 20, 30 percent off. So that incentivizes me to go and buy more at that time. Companies might also use this data to analyze trends. So trends are simply what they think would happen based on what has already happened. So, for example, in summer, does the sale of ice cream typically go up um, among school children? Yes, because the time is hot. They want to cool down. They like ice cream in winter. Do people tend to buy more socks from Amazon? Yes, because it's colder. People don't like stepping on the cold floor. So they can use this data to actually track and say, hmm, okay, I have 100 pairs of socks in my shop for winter, right? Last winter, however, I sold 5,000 pairs of socks. So it might make sense for me to buy an extra 4,900 pairs or 5,000 pairs, depending on how many they think they need this year. So we use the transactional data. Our companies might use this data to actually... Um, predict trends, what they think would happen or what they think will happen based on what has already happened in the past. Now, finally, we have targeted marketing. So what is targeted marketing? It involves breaking down the entire market into various segments and planning marketing strategies accordingly for each segment to increase the market share. That's a bit of a mouthful. Let me explain it my way. Targeted marketing is where companies, they use, for example, stuff like cookies and your transactional data to try and sell you stuff that's specific to you. Again, I buy a lot of technology, uh, electronic equipment, computer components on eBay and Amazon. So because of that, they know that when I log into eBay and Amazon, the first thing I most likely want to see on my homepage is probably going to be some tech thing. If I go into Amazon now, let's just see what comes up. If I go into Amazon now, um, I'm logged in. As you can see, okay, here's a Fire Stick. Here's a tablet, a Kindle, um, an Echo Dot. If I scroll down, look, mobile phones are presented to me. More items to consider, related items you viewed. Um, here we have monitors and down here again, we have, okay, suitcase is fine. Here, here we have more phones again. All of the stuff I normally look at is tech stuff. So it makes sense for Amazon to market me or to target when they market me. There's no point in trying to sell me makeup. So here's a section for jewelry, beauty. There's no point in them trying to sell me this stuff because in the past, 
traditionally, I have never bought any of these things. The things I keep buying every time I come to Amazon are tech things. So here's a smart thermostat I might buy at some point. So here's an entire section about smart devices for home, right? So targeted marketing is where the companies try to look at who you are, what you like, what you've bought before, and try to push those things, not, not push them, but to put them in front of you, potentially sometimes with good deals so that you are encouraged to buy them.